Thank you for coming. Thanks particularly to our panelists for coming. Um, we'll do introductions a little bit since we're such a small group, particularly. Um, you know from reading the description why each of our panelists are here a little bit, just a really quick in case you don't all know each other. Alex Cockett teaches in modern world languages, um, French, while it still exists, I guess. Um, and then TESOL and TEFL classes, which is everyone familiar with those abbreviations? Okay. Um, TESOL is teaching English for speakers of other languages, right? And TEFL is teaching English as a foreign language. Um, so slightly different, but related. Um, so she's here to speak from a language acquisition perspective. Um, she's also a native French speaker, so can maybe add some um, personal experience. Can I teach TEFL's only ESL class? Yes. So the um, L2 is an abbreviation that might also come up too, um, just because talking about ESL, English as a second language, is a little bit outdated because we know many people are learning it as a third or fourth. Um, Marianne Larson teaches in English. Um, you did your dissertation work in composition? Yeah. And, yeah. So besides having a lot of experience teaching writing um, as a skill and teaching writing in a content course, um, she has some too. Um, and Keith Brooks uh, is a professor of education, associate of professor of education, I give everybody the right titles, um, and cultural liaison. So he is able to give us some perspective on cultural diversity and cultural responsiveness in terms of teaching, writing, and grammar. Um, do you all want to introduce yourselves just briefly right now? I've got Peterson from nursing. And I'm Marge Schaefer from nursing also. Connie Clark from nursing. <laughs> oh, I forgot about you. I know everybody. <laughs> everybody knows you. Everybody knows you. I'm all right. teaching in the, the CAPS program. CAPS also. CAPS. Yeah. And okay. Andrea. Yeah, yeah, really all three levels. Does that say something about nursing that there are three people from the nursing department here? Nobody else. <laughs> Very conscientious. Yes, yeah. Yeah. That's what it said to me. Conscientious. Mm -hmm. yes. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I would say this is an issue that. <laughs> We're looking for answers. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to start by having each of the panelists just give us uh, briefly their perspective on grammar, um, given the particular lens uh, that they're here to speak from, um, and then maybe address some complications of that perspective. Um, and you can be as concrete or theoretical as you'd like to be in terms of these are the policies I use for grammar, or these are the um, theories that I approach this from. Um, how, wherever you'd like to take it, and then once each of you have given us a brief sense of your perspective, we'll dive into questions and answers. Alex, do you want to start? Yes, I'm going to be very brief too. I don't want to go cheat. I think you and nursing have a lot of different kinds of students when we talk about grammar errors, and I think of the international students who's learning English as a foreign language and coming here, uh, or an adult immigrant students, so people who grew up and went to school in another language and then come here. And that's, that group has particular grammar errors. Then you think of the immigrant student who was uh, either born and raised here as a second generation immigrant or people who were um, you know, born in abroad but went to school here their whole life. And that's a different set of grammar issues. And then I think of the native English speaker who just isn't good at grammar. And I'm sure we have some of those in our classes. I, I sure do. And then I also think of um, Native speakers of English who speak non-standard dialects of English. So whether it's African American vernacular, or if you think of here in Minnesota, a person writes with a southern um, written accent. I, I don't know if saying soda instead of coke or pop is a grammatical error, but it's a vocabulary choice that you know we wouldn't make as Minnesotans. Uh, so I think there's all these different categories of people that I think we have pretty much all four categories in nursing. From talking with you guys. And, and working with you guys in the past. <coughs> and I think the errors are very different. And one of the things to consider is whether or not people have academic English, which is you differentiate that in ESL or in um, second language acquisition. You have the everyday English, and then you have the academic English. And academic English is what we need in the college setting, and it takes five to seven years of exposure to academic English and training in that language. <coughs> and so if you're a student who's been here for 20 years but hasn't been trained in academic English for the last two years in a community college setting will not have had a chance to develop that fully yet. They'll still be in process. Doesn't mean that they can't do it, it means they're in process and it could take up to seven years. 
So that's something to keep in mind. That even if you see a student not making progress this year with the grammar from one semester to the next semester, it's a seven year process. So one semester is a small step in that uh, longer process. Um, while the people are in process, we call that intro language, as in they're in between um, just novice language to advanced language. And that intro language usually has students have their own rules of grammar they go with. Because they don't have the right rules quite yet, and so they have their own rules that they're using as a stopgap while they get the real rules set up. And in older students, we see those you know, false rules or temporary rules sometimes become fossilized. Think of a fossil. Last thousands of years, right? So a fossilized error is an error that kind of gets entrenched. It's really hard to remove it. That's just the way the students are going to speak. Like, I speak really fast. I can't really get away from that. I always speak really fast. And so um, you could think this a fossilized something. And so you see students who will make the same grammar error, um, who will use the same sentence structures with a mistake in it, and you correct it, and they make it again, and you correct it. And that's a fossilized turn of phrase or something that they've learned in that way, and they're finished learning that. So that some, you have different strategies based on what kind of errors you see. If it's an in-progress grammar error versus a fossilized grammar error, you have to address that differently. Um, so that's very um, technical. So I, think. Um, I think of written accents, you brought that up. And we think of uh, first thing language acquisition. People do have an accent based on their first language and what their writing style is in their first language. And I'm not thinking about essay structure, but sentence structure. What we think is a run-on, some people think is a basic sentence. So you'll see a lot of those. I have a student who always starts with, here we see. And so you cannot say, here we see, for every sentence. And you'll say something, which is, you can't have a which is in every sentence. And so those are, in his language, in his first language, those are acceptable and academic ways of speaking. They don't translate. And so some of those things are people's accents, just like you could have somebody with a southern accent like I said before. Those are accents. And to what degree do we want somebody to sound Correct versus standard is kind of a discussion we can have of, you know, you can have correct grammar that's just a style that's less appropriate or slightly like awkward. There's a degree between awkward and incorrect, if that makes sense. Um, so how much of an accent can we tell her before it becomes grammatically wrong versus just grammatically accented is something I can discuss too. Um, the last bit of theory would be the Krashen, Dr. Krashen, and this monitor model, the idea that we can learn something consciously, and we can also acquire things, like just soak it up. The things you soak up will come out naturally. The things you have to learn, like if you teach your student a phrase, or teach a new word in nursing, or a new way of writing a sentence, they have to think it as they write it, so it's not a natural way of saying it. And if you think of the cognitive load of, you're trying to say something difficult, like you've just been learning, you're trying to meet the assignment requirement, and then you're trying to use this phrase at the same time, with this grammatical structure, it's a lot cognitive to handle. Um, so ideally, I think the students would write out the content first, and then go back and look at the grammar second, and see a tutor of two, and that would require them to work on the assignment three weeks ahead of time. And not all assignments are available three weeks ahead of time. I don't think my assignments are available that much ahead of time all the time either. Um, and we think also of the effective filters and the things that Krashen talks about. When the student's really nervous, it hinders the ability to think. So the cognitive load is impaired, or cognitive processing is impaired because of the stress. So if they read paper for your class before and they got a C because of language and they're writing paper for your class again and they're just so scared of getting a C again and they feel so demoralized, that's going to prevent them from actually focusing on the grammar accuracy. So it's, I mean, and at the same time, you know, I think our purpose in academia is to produce students who can write in a way that does us proud and that serves them in their profession. And so passing a student who makes mistakes all the time is, isn't an answer either. Um, what I think we need to consider then is our purpose in grammar. Do we want them to write proper grammar because it bothers them when they don't? Uh, or is it because it's going to make them look bad in their job? Um, do they want to have perfect grammar? I think that's something we can negotiate with the students. And then I think our attitude is important to have an attitude of being constructive. We tend to be, I can be, I'm a, I'm a grammarian, I love grammar, and I get bothered when I see an error come up, and I get very bothered. And it's like the, you know, a rock in your shoe kind of thing. And so, switching the attitude of being bothered to an attitude of charity towards this kind of compassion and saying, okay, we need to meet them where they're at. And they make that mistake. And our role isn't to say, well, they should know how to write by then or by now. You know, they should know how to do this, they should know how to do that, or corrected this before. But saying, okay, there's still work to be done here. How can I support this student? Where can I direct them? How can we address this constructively in partnership with the student? With an attitude, you know, to be 
if you want to write properly, and they want to write properly, properly is in grammatically standard Minnesotan. Um, you know, you can bit about the head with their errors, or you can try to strategize with them what's going to work for them in their learning. And so I think it's, it takes patience and it takes love, and I think that's what that feels all about. We want to care for our students. That's what you hear. Is that it? Keith, do you want to go next? Huh? I think Marion's process definitely. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, well, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just didn't it Okay. Yeah. My name is Paul Lives. I'm an adjunct yeah, for CAPS. Okay. Great. What I'm subject? Just, yeah, I teach a financial wellness course. Okay. Um, All right. So I just finished helping develop an online one that's mm -hmm. starting in March. I saw the uh, the discussion thread kind of really interested me. <laughs> the Gettysburg Address and all the <laughs> yes. all the grammatical errors in that and that kind of encouraged me to come here. It, it interested me. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming. One of the things that struck me on the CPAC committee. Don't ask me what it stands for. All day trying to figure out what But either way, we're looking at alumni uh, or alum surveys and their mm -hmm. responses. And one of the themes from the 10-year-out alum, the 5-year-out, and the 1-year-out alum is I feel inadequate to live in a multicultural world. That's one of the huge themes. It's not the only one. There's lots of positives, lots of other, other, other issues. But that was one that we finished talking about this past week during our meeting. So uh, what stood out to me from looking at the agenda was uh, just how powers communicated the language. And even just through, through terminology, poor, or poverty, um, unfortunate, or less fortunate, or underprivileged, mm -hmm. or um, underrepresented, or the term minority, or underprepared, or even provisional. Like, so all of them come with some sort of extra meaning that, so there's what, 10 or 11 of us in the room, we might have 10 or 11 different definitions. And then all of us may not even use the term, because one person might say, hey, that's a derogatory term. I don't use that term to identify anybody, students, people, anybody. Um, so there are a few phrases that jump out to me, figures of speech that have everyday meaning. And some of y'all may be familiar with them, some of you may be unfamiliar with them, some of y'all may know the origin of them, some of y'all may not. One of them is crack the whip. Another one is, and I'll give you the document later, uh, another one is Dutch treat. Going Dutch, uh, Jit, uh, Indian Giver, Indian Summer, uh, Jew Him Down, a uh, Little White Lie, Low Man on the Totem Pole, Manhole Cover, On the Fritz, Rule of Thumb, Sink or Swim. Now, have any of y'all familiar with any of them? Any of them? You've heard? Okay. So, most all of these are very derogatory in some terms, but they're ones that perhaps most of us have grew up hearing, but didn't understand, I didn't understand the meaning of most of these terms, so I was well into my late 20s, and I didn't realize I was using some of these phrases to describe some interactions with people. So, when it comes to students of color, it's not always on the end of how do we get them up to speed, and many times that's the nature of the, of the approach or the dialogue, or sometimes uh, that's... You know, maybe it's a pattern, I don't know, but uh, that's always seems to be the disposition of how we deal and talk about them. Um, but what do we do when their thoughts are profound in class and their papers are stellar? That, that's another issue on the other end of the spectrum, is when, uh, uh, for example, uh, a professor said to a student recently, uh, sometimes you make, you make statements that uh, I didn't even think of. And sometimes I just don't know how to respond to them. But it was communicated in a way where the student felt like, okay, maybe I shouldn't speak anymore. Um, and, and so what I'm saying is language is, is it's not only the written language, but it's, it's verbal and it's also nonverbal. You know, language is it's just it's communication. It's a mobile tool, which, which we all know uh, and familiar with. And then what happens when their pa papers are off the charts well? Um, but... Some of our white students may have been subpar on the same papers, but yet get a better grade. And students have verifications that that's taking place. You know, what, what, are, what are we supposed to do? How, how do you approach another professor? And does a professor even, are they even open to you, or are they in a defensive posture? 
And then there's language that takes place there in that dialogue and in that interaction. So language is a method of communication. And so I believe we need to question the method. So even with the phrase, you know, uh, standard. Well, who's writing standards and who says what standard? Um, that's a good conversation there. But our socialization really needs to be reflected upon. And then what is said versus what is meant? Okay, this is what I said, but here's what I meant. It didn't come out correctly. Or on my paper, or student's paper. Here's what I said in the paper, but I didn't verbalize it accurately. What kind of effective instructor am I to help pull that greatness out as opposed to just demean because I don't understand it? Or to just mark off? And then, of course, what is said versus what is not said. And then, now, how would you all respond to the following statement? So I'm a professor talking to you as a student. You have deficiencies because of where you grew up, and it can't be changed or conquered, so just take whatever we give you. Now that's a, a paraphrase of what a professor uh, here said to a student uh, about their writing uh, skills. So, um, you know, your school didn't prepare you to be here. That was kind of the, the phraseology that the professor used. But what the professor communicated was what I just mentioned to you. That's how the student took it. Um, or even talking around a student, meaning uh, what, what happens when students come to a professor's office and then stop and hear their name being talked about with another professor in a way of, uh, you know, I don't know what we're going to do with this student, this student's writing is dot, dot, dot. So that communicates something as well, um, where a student is viewed as, similar to, to what, what we just mentioned, where a student is viewed as an inconvenience or a problem or somebody to be fixed. Uh, so then that assumes a superiority as if I'm the one that's going to fix it, you know. Um, and then lastly here, in the context of classroom teaching, nonverbals, facial expressions, tone of voice, volume, timing. Language communicates intention, meaning, expectations, values, beliefs and feelings, aggression, passion, assertiveness, harm, love, friendliness, patience, power, control, manipulation, validation, affirmation, rejection, acceptance, disappointment, uh, who's included, who's excluded. Language can label, motivate, dehumanize, and influence policy. So it's imperative to validate the home or the main or the primary language, which is already said, and professional or academic or scholarly communication. So that's great to be able to do both. Um, and then, so code switching. You know, how many of us are familiar with code switching? And teaching context. Context. Um, and, and lastly, um, Addressing the grammar for many of our white students, um, uh, I've observed is around text language, um, IM language, uh, instant messaging language, uh, Twitter language, you know, so social language, but for some reason sometimes it doesn't transfer to their papers, as well as the students of So I think it's important to recognize that many of our students have some deficiencies in this area in terms of, or areas to improve rather, as opposed to deficiencies. Um, but one should be not looked at as better than the other, but they're both areas to improve. Uh, so what says a lot to our students is who we choose for our textbooks, articles, films, for dialogue and learning as well. Students recognize that if it's just coming from one culture or perspective. Um, and if they are behind in terms of their writing, am I effective enough to help them improve? Many of our students write the way they speak, which was also mentioned uh, just now. And if our students require support and leadership, um, do I feel confident and competent to give that, to provide that to them? That was all. That was all. All right. Um, I think I, well, I think I'm going to repeat a couple of things that have already been said, but I'll say them in a slightly different way, so maybe we'll think that's good or bad. Uh, so I, I'm still going to talk from more of a theoretical standpoint initially, and then we can get down to, so what might I do with this? But I have, I guess, sort of five, five statements, um, sort of all under the category of where might uh, grammatical errors come from in student writing. And I find it really helpful to think about this question uh, with students in general as well as with individual students, because what I might do um, in working with an individual student would have a lot to do with sort of how I diagnose the situation. Um, okay, so uh, 
one comment is, I guess, the observation that um, language development, both in oral language and in written language, isn't a linear progression. Um, and so I, I think we have a tendency to think in terms of uh, like building blocks. So you, can, you have to get your words right, and then you have to get your sentences right, and then you can graduate onto paragraphs and then longer utterances. And um, that's not the case if you look at little kids acquiring their first oral language. It's also not the case when it comes to learning how to write well. And so um, if I remind myself of that, I, I, virtually every student I've ever had, no matter what the class is, is a really interesting mix of really sophisticated and skilled when it comes to some aspects of language use and um, needing to develop in some other areas. And so e even if I see a student paper where I feel like, oh my goodness, needs to develop, needs to develop, you know, in 15 measures, if I keep reminding myself that there is something that this person already knows intuitively about how language works mm -hmm. in a really sophisticated way, if I can learn how to build on that, instead of thinking someone is 100% at a basic level. Um, and so that uh, language learning, oral and written, is a very uh, complex and recursive process. Um, so I guess that's kind of a, an observation about that. Um, Alex already mentioned about the cognitive load. And I, I guess the way I would say that is that writing um, taxes our long-term and our short-term memory. Now fortunately, uh, my laptop right now is new enough that I have plenty of memory, so I, I almost never get the spinning wheel that never ends, and my computer almost never shuts down now if I have too many windows open at once. Remember how even just a couple of years ago, you give your computer too many tasks at once and it just kind of freezes. Um, and so people who are skilled with a particular kind of writing, um, the cognitive load is greatly diminished because we're able to do so much automatically. Mm -hmm. English is my first language. Uh, really, it's my only <laughs> language. And um, if I, I and spelling and punctuation have always been things that, for whatever reason, have come naturally to me. So even if I'm writing about a new idea, I'm not having to. It's not mentally taxing for me to generate sentences to punctuate them correctly most of the time. Um, so I can almost do that on autopilot, and then I can really concentrate on the content of what I'm communicating. But if I'm doing a new type of writing, so maybe I, if I had to suddenly write a lab report, I'd have to think back to, oh my gosh, freshman year in college when I took, you know, so if, if you're writing in a new form and you're suddenly having to ask, how do you document a source here, or where does the heading go? Um, or if you're in a new, in a course where the conceptual ideas and the terminology is so new, that becomes almost like learning a new language so that um, if I'm in a situation of um, having a whole bunch of things all at once that are taxing my short-term memory, I'm a lot more likely to make errors. Um, so I guess that's, that's an observation about where some sources of error might come from. Um, the third point is uh, kind of related to the second one is that um, one thing that tends to set uh, effective writers apart from less effective writers is that more effective writers are good at, uh, at thinking about how to divide a big complex task down into more manageable pieces. They maybe can't even articulate what they're doing, but they, they may kind of naturally know. So, so for example, I know if I'm writing a new kind, a kind of writing I'm not accustomed to about concepts that are difficult, and I may be trying to do some stylistic experimentation. I know that I can't do all of that in one shot. Um, so I'm, I know how to kind of divide it up into manageable pieces. Students aren't very good at dividing things up into manageable pieces. And if they get feedback from us about what's not working, they're not very good at problem solving and kind of looking at the 85 comments that maybe one of, them, one of us gave them on a paper and kind of knowing what should I tackle first what should I do next? So then we're back to the cognitive overload problem. I'm trying to do everything at once. Um, I guess the, my fourth statement is that uh, errors in mechanics, um, so what we often call grammatical errors, but basically punctuation or spelling errors, almost always uh, signal a variety of things. I, I literally, I don't think I've 
I don't think I've ever gotten a paper from a student that had lots of mechanical errors that had no other errors at all. Um, I'm, I'm not talking about someone who persistently confuses ITS and IT apostrophe S. So I'm not talking about like one error, but you know, if you're reading a paper that's got 20 or 30 mechanical errors per page, um, I, I literally can't think of a time where there were no other problems. So the problem might have to do with that person still trying to understand the content, um, being a second language learner, having significant code switching to do. I mean, it's often a whole bunch of things going on at once. Um, and I guess the, uh, the last statement, which is kind of related to that, is that um, errors almost always exhibit a pattern of some kind. And um, one way that I can help to make, especially for students who really struggle, one way that I can help increase the likelihood that this person will maybe be able to make some progress <laughs> is if I can help to point out, um, here's a pattern I notice um, in, in some of the errors that you're making. Um, I mean, it might be as little as I notice that you're consistently uh, putting a period outside of the end quotation mark rather than inside. So I mean, it might be a little thing which is easy to explain and therefore easy to fix. But there's almost always patterns of that sort um, that if I can point out that one pattern, it, especially if I say, oh, I've, you notice I've made 30 marks per page. <laughs> which I wouldn't recommend, and we can talk about that in a second. I made 30 marks per page, but 25 of them are all examples of this. Um, that can help the whole thing feel less overwhelming. Um, okay, I can think of uh, probably 25 other things I would say, but I'm sure that you guys can too, so I'll stop. Great. Are there burning questions that you have for the panelists, or things you'd like to follow up on or clarify? The cognitive overload piece, um, ways to deal with that, you know, I need that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, um, here's part of the problem, I think. Uh, of course, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't include here the fact that one of the realities is a lot of students aren't very good at managing their time and aren't very good at being realistic about predicting how long it's going to take to do well on an assignment. <laughs> and then you add on to it people, yeah. And you add on to it people who have had a history of doing poorly in writing don't tend to be the very first people to come and ask for help and they don't tend to be the ones who start early on an assignment. They tend to be the ones I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I'm always bad at it, I'm going to delay as long as possible. Guess what? I now am setting myself up for failure. So, um, I I never teach a class where I make um, drafting and revising optional. Um, if I'm going to require it of, of anybody, I require it of everybody. Um, now, if it's, a, if it's a class where students are doing like weekly short pieces, I don't usually have them do drafts of that also. It depends on what the assignment is, but um, I, I, I build in, and I don't make a distinction here between freshmen versus seniors. Um, I don't tell myself, oh, you should learn that when you were 18, now you're 22. Um, I just assume that everybody would benefit from it. So uh, I do some kind of required process work that, um, and I experiment with, you know, how much should it count, and, but th that has some kind of, it counts for real. It's not just, you'll do better. Um, and that's where I put my commenting energy. I, there, a person who's, she's now retired, but uh, one of my favorite articles I've ever read about teaching writing, the title was on not being a, uh, a servant to composition or something like that. And, and this person said she used to sit there during finals week having collected these final research papers, and she said and I would spend like an hour or two hours per paper writing all these comments, and I would sit there getting angrier and angrier about how much I hate my students because no one, none of them are going to come and pick up the paper, none of them are going to read my comments. And she said, and then I thought, what is wrong with me? Um, so I, I put that energy into stuff that they can. And students actually report that. I mean, the research on what kind of comments on what kind of feedback on writing is effective, mm -hmm. it's essentially formative feedback. Yep. Students pay very little, if any, attention 
to our summary feedback after a final draft. If there's not an opportunity to revise, they're efficient enough that they're not even looking. That makes sense. The they just look for the grade. They look mm -hmm. for the grade. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. After the cognitive, <laughs> the cognitive overload thing, and you're talking about knowing how to divide tasks. This year, I teach an upper level French class, which is 300, right, for, so for juniors. And I have mostly freshmen in the class. Mm -hmm. First semester of freshmen, mm -hmm. because that's at the French level. And I can definitely see the wheels turning, and people are going, huh? We're doing what now? Huh? We're doing what now? And so I've been very intentional about teaching skills in that class. Mm -hmm. Sure, they're learning French, and then they're learning, so they're learning how to write in French, and they're learning facts about French history and culture and all these things, and they really need to think about those things. Um, but I'm really building in my class skill building, which you guys do with nursing, you have to do skill building. I'm sure with financial wellness too, it's all about yeah. building those skills. Mm -hmm. And so I take the time, I record the tech notes for two specific formats, which they hated. And I said, try this format for note taking for two weeks. Or three weeks, maybe three weeks, and then we switch a different format. So I'm modeling some of the skills, and I think for paper writing is the same. So I'm saying, okay, this week the bibliography is due, this week your outline is due, this week your first draft is due. And to teach them, you have to submit, especially in French, they can't just write in French at an academic level straight out. So we're trying to break it down, and I think it works for any paper. At least the first time you do the paper, to model with them, okay, when I write this paper, here are the steps I'm going to follow to break down my task. Yeah. And whether you put a grade attached to that or not, whether you have a deadline or not, whether the deadline is to check in with a TA, or, you know, so you don't have to become Superwoman and or Superman and give feedback on every little step of the process necessarily. But to teach them, okay, this, these are some of the steps. Here is how you can break down the notes. Because note taking is essential for writing. And if they don't have good notes, they have to rewrite every chapter. They have to re read every chapter they've ever read. And so some of those skill building things don't take that long. So just say, no, so what are some dates you give yourself? They can make their own deadlines for the project. But that you can give the students the tools to do that. And you already do that for the nursing concepts. It's a matter of doing that for the academic writing concept as well. So, and it's, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And the Ask Office is all the resources that never get checked out. The Ask Office is uh, DVDs and information about test-taking anxiety and about writing strategies and all these different things that the students never check out. So as a professor, you can check those out, show them in your class. They have 10-minute videos or less. And, you know, and introduce the students to, hey, these are resources. Or put them on your Moodle's an assignment as you reflect on it. They are always, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Those resources are there. And so there are resources about the cognitive development and how to break things down. Mm -hmm. There are resources about managing time. People work really hard to create those videos. I mean, everybody used to sit on a, somewhere in a disk drive in electronic dust on them. And, and what, what Alex was saying about kind of dividing things up, it, so I don't know if you're thinking this March, but you might be thinking, okay, I can see how that's helpful, but what does this have to do with uh, correctness and with punctuation? Um, my son just graduated from college. He's not a very good writer. He's got certain um, grammatical and spelling issues that are persistent problems. They've been problems since he was in fifth grade, and they're still problems. Um, and I've noticed that uh, he knows that there are problems, and if he gives himself time to go through a couple of drafts of something, then the difference between his first draft and his final draft, the frequency of those errors goes down dramatically, even if no one but him mm -hmm. reads over his paper. Yeah. Um, Let's throw in a couple things. Um, going back to cognitive and I think as students are writing papers, cognitive overload can kick in. You know, they're trying to deal with the content, you know, they're trying to, you know, you know, they're thinking about the mechanics of their writing, they're thinking about all that. But equally, cognitive overload, I think, occurs when they get papers back, you know, yeah. as well, too. And um, most of what I know about writing relates to teaching children to write, but I think a lot of principles are, are pretty similar. But, you know, what I teach a lot is the idea of really having the first comment that somebody sees on a paper be something positive. Because I think the degree to which somebody learns based on our comments is based on their openness to what we have to say. So, yeah. So I think you've got to really start positive, you know, with it. And then I go, I go to golf now is where I go after this and my writing, my writing strategies. But with, with golf, anytime you're trying to improve, they say basically you, you can only have about one swing thought at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to make that swing and you're thinking of 14 different things, it will never work for you. It's just going to be a mess. So I think with, with writing, what I try to do, especially with undergrads, 
is point out what they're doing well because I want them to continue to do those things. And then I try to keep the cognitive overload not on overload, you know, by helping them focus on one, two, or maybe three things, you know, that they can that they can work on. And then as I see those things, um, you know, them kind of gain those skills, whatever they are, then I'll s start to introduce something else they might want to think about too. Because otherwise, I think there is a degree at which they they just shut down, you know, if it's just too overwhelming. And to me, the importance of of not mixing. You know, content feedback with mechanical feedback is key because once you start, in my mind, once you start mixing content and mechanics, there is so much going to be on a paper typically that it's, that it's pretty overwhelming. Um, but I go back to kind of my golf analogy a lot. And when I'm working with teachers, I, and I watch hundreds and hundreds of teachers, I do the identical thing. You know, I start with the positive stuff, I give them two to three things to think about. I follow up on it, I watch how they do on those, and then we're ready to introduce something else. And they feel good about that because they want to grow, they want to be challenged in some way, you know, yet it's manageable and it's not too much, you know, that's it's taken away. Well, I mean, the other thing, first of all, there's a huge body of research about responding to student work that matches with what you just said. Yeah. But the other thing is, if part of the problem for many less experienced writers is not knowing how to prioritize and not knowing how to divide a task into manageable pieces. And part of what I'm trying to model is out of the range of things that you might conceivably work on in revising this piece, what is most important to work on right now um, and what is next most important to work on right now. And if, if along the way, if I've circled or underlined every place where there's a mechanical error, um, I'm kind of sending the message to the student that, okay, yeah, 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 I know you said I should make that point more clear and I should reorganize, or maybe I should start over, or maybe I have the concepts wrong, but I see that you circled 20 mechanical errors. If I fix those, surely that's going to make a difference in the grade. Yeah. And, okay, maybe it will make a difference in the grade, but it's not going to make a very big difference in the grade, and it's, it's not going to make the paper enough, uh, enough better. That's a good point. And one of the things that I've done, done to remove that pressure from them is to focus more on meaning and substance than style. So um, although grammar is weighed, I don't weigh it as heavily as what did they get from this activity, this event, or this article that they read, or this film that they watched. Mm -hmm. I want to know substance and the meaning, mm -hmm. um, but I also definitely uh, <clears throat> correct some of, some of the grammar as well. But I've removed some of that pressure from them. Because it's not a specific writing class, although their writing is important. Mm -hmm. And even being explicit about when to do things, mm -hmm. um, by saying, I'm concerned about your content right here, or mm -hmm. this is polished, or this is, I'm right, I want you to write to think in this, versus um, I want you to write to communicate in this, and with what kind of an audience, mm -hmm. right? Um, because with that cognitive overload, we, we get that too. We just, again, have learned a fragment of the process, right? You generate, generate, explore, generate, and then you edit, and you manage, and you focus. Um, and when we do research, when we write, we know that. Um, and one of the ways to model good process, too, is to tell the students directly, um, this is the time. Don't worry about grammar and mechanics. In fact, I'm not even going to comment on it, which is really hard to do. One of the most amazing things for me has been the amount of self-control that it takes to ignore the rock in my shoe, right? Pay attention to their dance moves, not the fact that they're stepping on your toes all the time. Um, but to, to model how important is grammar um, and at what point in this process by saying, I'm going to look at rough drafts, but the only thing I'm going to comment on is your content and maybe your organization because that's what you should be thinking about right now. Well, and, and, and then, I mean, if you want some concrete ideas then, so if I've done that on a draft and then let's say this is the day a paper is due, one thing I'll do occasionally is uh, we'll devote, depends on how long a paper is, you know, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour of class time, I'll bring in a couple of dictionaries, some handbooks, and I'll say, Here's time for you if you want to exchange your paper with someone else or if you just want to read your own. I want you only to do editing and proofreading. Um, and uh, I'm here as a resource. Your classmates are here as resources. And I might even say, April's really good at this. And Beth is, if you have a question about semicolons, Beth is your go-to person or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I say, any errors you find, 
correct for yourself right now. Go ahead and pencil it in, um, and I, uh, I won't hold those against you. Um, mm. Or kind of, if I kind of look around and I see there's a whole bunch, whole bunch of correcting going on, I might say, um, if I'm going to extend the deadline of this paper now until noon tomorrow or until the next class period, for for you to go ahead and make those editing corrections. I mean, I don't, I don't always do that, but that also sends the message that you're more likely to notice those errors if that's the one thing that you're focusing on. I would say there, this is kind of grammar is important, and I think when we talk about you know students who are learning English, sometimes the error, the grammatical errors, interfere with meaning. You do not understand what they're trying to say, mm -hmm. and that's a problem, right? Because the purpose of the paper or the lab report, whatever it is, is to communicate. So there are errors you can let go of in some sense if you choose to, and there are errors you cannot let go of because you don't understand what they're saying and they're losing points over that. Sure. So there's a time, I think, to, and those are part of a pattern, and maybe that sometimes when they make that error, <coughs> it doesn't interfere, sometimes it does. And I would say in some settings, you know, it's, it's like to say, well, content matters more, but then they're going to graduate and try to find a job, and their resume is going to have massive errors. And that's not okay. And we can't send them out, pretend everything's nice and okay, and you're gonna get to the world, and you're gonna write your nursery report, and the next nurse will not know what medication you prescribe. That is not okay, right? This is life, and it is, it's not okay. And so, I think this, like April was saying, there are times when we want to have grammar be a focus, and there's times when we don't need to. And I think of testing situations, classes that have essay exams, and you get most of the multiple choice exams, I think. Classes when you have essay exams, the fact that it's an exam, you're already so scared. And to correct grammar during those essay exams is kind of productive. The students cannot focus on the, the time allotted, the content, and the points, and oh, and then, you know, grammar, no. Uh, but if you're there doing a report, a paper that's at home, that you can do multiple drafts, that you can seek help on, then you can be stricter with the grammar if you choose, if it's right for your purpose. So you have to think of what your purpose is in the assignment. If your assignment is to check whether they went to the clinical or not, and they're going to think about it, maybe grammar doesn't matter. If their assignment is to practice writing a report that they want to write professionally for whatever field, then grammar does matter. So we need to be conscious of who their audience is, their practice audience is, what's the purpose of the assignment is, and what's the purpose of correctness of communication in that assignment. And I think for nursing especially, being able to use the conventions, you know, some things you can abbreviate, some things you can't. Sometimes present tense versus past tense makes a difference. Does the patient still have this issue or is it resolved? The patient That's what is in a coma, the patient was in a coma. That makes a difference, right? And so <laughs> there, are, uh, there are specific errors that matter more for meaning than other errors. Like the, the period after the citation, sometimes if the student will never cite again in their nursing reports, really? Is this a thing you want to lose points over? Um, but you know, the past tense and the nursing report, hugely important. Uh, just like in finance, plus or minus, hugely important. <laughs> <laughs> the period being the right place, hugely important. Yeah. And so I think we need to really think about not grammatic grammar as a static thing, but really what our purposes are with grammar and, and what think, you're teaching. I think that relates to what Keith addressed too in terms of power, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can tell students sit around, you know, help help each other correct this, right? But what's that's really awkward. Right? If a student is using, um, has ways of using language that I'm not familiar with, and this is my peer, and I'm supposed to tell them what you're doing is wrong, even though I don't know why, right? Because I don't know what the rule is or the terminology necessarily. Um, to be very careful that we're not creating a right and wrong necessarily, right? But what is the purpose? Who are you writing to and why are you writing this? Because then there's a shared context around what's most important, what you know, what is the, the way to express this idea. Um, and that, that can really help us to help them help themselves. <laughs> well, nobody wants to pair up with like, international students. Right. I mean, why would you have you take a review by someone who doesn't know English? Like, I'm just speaking as, you know, I mean, I, mean, why, I mean, as a student, I would seriously, why am I wasting my time with this person who I know has horrible grammar they, when they talk they make mistakes? You know, and so you have to, like you say, what having a specific purpose? I mean, you know, that, that student can handle punctuation. Maybe they're going to make an ED ending error, but they can handle punctuation, and that's okay. Or maybe this person's really good at the worst concepts yeah. and can help me make sure that I'm getting it right. My concern for nursing, I think, I don't know about finance as much. That concept for nursing is you actually those books there, you could build a house with these books. They're so <laughs> thick. 
and you have to cover so much, and the students cannot not know it. They, they have to be prepared right when they get a job. This is life and death, like I said. It's, and so, how do you make time? I mean, we're talking about all these great things you can do, but that takes time away from teaching the nursing. So, how important in your purpose is grammatical accuracy? And can it come at the cost of some content knowledge or not? And, and I'm admitting that our answer cannot be grammar is important all the time. That's what I want it to be. I was thinking, I want say, that she don't want to be known as being mm -hmm. a little more lenient. You know, like, <laughs> sometimes students ask a question, now, how are you about APA or how are you? And I would never want to say, well, I'm, you know, it's not, you know, as long as you're getting the content, that's mm -hmm. what Because they will take that to be, yeah. <laughs> to get them freedom as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I think I struggle probably most with. Our CAP students and our graduate students, because I think the level of expectation out there is fairly high. So on the one hand, and I know no one is saying this to say grammar doesn't matter, just so you get the idea. Um, it's not really doing them a service, right? Right. 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 Because I think our goal needs needs to be to prepare them so that in fact they can communicate their ideas yep. to other people. And many of them um, know a thesis is down the road as well too. Exactly. And exactly. They, they know yep. that they need to know AP style. And, yes. And be yes. grammatically accurate. Yeah. yeah. And so I think I think that you know the <laughs> challenge is again, yeah, that, that we're not. It's not a writing course. Mm -hmm. We're teaching a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. Um, although I would say, for instance, you know, there's a little more flexibility, maybe in, at least in caps, in terms of it isn't quite the same content-driven kind of things in caps. But I think I think it, and, and the other, I guess the other comment too would be I, I you know, I know there are some people that you know they have to write a paper, they just, just you turn it in, it doesn't matter. But for for many people, that's self-expression. Self mm -hmm. and and so when that's handed over to someone else and it comes back with you know, mm -hmm. all over the place, myself is being attacked. Not, yeah. and, and and I and I and that is very that's, that's very problematic because because you know again I think about people who you know are some of our students in caps well in graduate school too who you know, know one, two, three, four other languages yeah. and have lived a whole world of experience yeah. right. and, and end up feeling attacked right. because of what's happened on their paper. Right. And yet on the other hand, again, thinking, but you know, you've got what it takes to be a leader, mm -hmm. yeah. but yeah. The, your words and how you use them are getting in the way of that. I mean, what, one thing that I, I handle this really differently depending on the course and depending on the particular student. I mean, it's a whole bunch of factors, but um, if I have a student who I know the issue is not failing to put in time. Okay, so this is a person who is doing the work, who is working hard to understand the material, but maybe it's a second language issue or whatever. Um, I'll sometimes kind of negotiate a personalized grammatical contract kind of with this person. So, I, I, I mean, I, I can think of, uh, I don't know, let's say it's a class where they write several things for me. I might, I, I might say, and I usually do this in a lot of classes I teach, the first couple of things, I'm particularly paying attention to content, and I want to get a sense of what the writing is like. So then if I start noticing um, certain patterns in your writing, and I know that you're going to be writing several things for me, or like in your in your area, since you have the same students in multiple courses throughout the program. Um, I mean, maybe not you specifically, but I just mean the nursing program does. Maybe uh, a way of kind of helping to say to the student, let's kind of focus on this one grammatical issue in this course. Let's let's really focus on this issue. I'm going to. Um, that's going to be the one I'm going to try to explain to you. I want to try to help you grow in this area. It's like, well, back to golf. It's like, you know what? Uh, to help your swing improve, let's really, really focus on this one thing. Um, and then, uh, kind of depending on how that how that goes, then maybe in the next course or on if 
somebody makes a lot of makes quick progress, then maybe it's in even the next assignment. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's a range. Of and so you even say, you know, maybe the weight of the grammar is, is the same percentage as for every other student in the course, but your grammar grade is only going to be on tenths or subject verb agreement. And that's going to pay greater dividends for the way that student learns to write, mm -hmm. to focus on that one, because it's better if they leave having one thing done with than having 15 things kind of done with. You have to be careful with that, though. Um, mm -hmm. If the student has a registered disability, you can do individualized accommodations. Mm -hmm. If the student does not, we're supposed to make, if you make your own accommodation for a student it's not required to have accommodation, then you need to make those available to the class. Technically, I think this is a legal obligation we have. And so if you make a contract with one person, you have to be willing to make a contract with anybody yeah, else. Yeah, I mean, and I... And you have to make it public, public that you, you know, if you want to work on something specific in grammar, then, you know, it becomes a whole kind of work. So, like, so that's, you know, a legal issue because uh, having, in, not having interest in first language is not a disability. Because like you said, people who know other languages, right. it is a barrier to be able to produce, you know, it is a barrier to the learning in some way because you are learning the language as you're learning the content. Uh, but it's not a considered disability, and so then you have to be very careful. Adam, how do you respond to people when they say that you're lowering the standard by doing that? I think you should not lower the standard. I think you should up the support. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> well, and I would argue that's, 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 that's a way of upping the support. I think it is, and you need to make it available to everyone. So you have to be willing right. to do it for everybody. Right, what I'm saying is the mindset of many people is that that's lowering the standard. I agree with you. I'm, 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 I'm saying, <laughs> how, do you respond, how do you respond to, I to that? There's been, I think, because we have, um, you know, you can even, if you talk about race and language, you have white, native speaking students, upper middle class students, you know, the, the, the students that are supposed to know everything, who struggle with writing. Mm -hmm. And so it's an issue for everyone. Yes. And to say, you know, we lower the standards, well, you know, and I think when you teach those tools like, you know, modeling, modeling the writing process, uh, picking one grammar point for each person to work on, all these things are really just you're teaching people how to learn. Regardless of why you have a problem in a way, so I, I don't think it's lower than standards. And um, I think if you skills building to me is huge in a class and making time. I know you have to teach all the nursing concepts, and I have to teach all the right now. I have to teach all the French historical things. In the grand scheme of things, if I don't take time to teach skills, they will not learn the French historical things. And so you will teach more nursing by taking less time to teach it. If you include skills building, is my personal philosophy for teaching. However, you have also have to know how to do skills building, and I think that's where we're this meeting is, okay, which skills can you target? How do you target grammar? How do you do skill building through grammar? Yeah. I just have a question. I don't know if there's any research that supports this, but if you evaluate in a writing assignment and you really want, you know, you're looking for good writing, you're holding those standards, yes. what percentage should, be, should the content be, and what percentage should the grammar writing be? Is there any research that supports yeah, a certain that's good percentage? Question. It's kind of cool. It's a, if you, I, I work with a lot of assessments, so I'm teaching assessment class now, and you know it too, so you want a valid assessment, you, know, right. you want that going on. So it's always going to go back to what your objectives are for that particular assignment. And I don't think you could say it's got to be a 75-25 or a 60-40 or whatever. It's got to go back exactly to what your objectives are, and then, you know, and then it's got to be it's got to be related to that. I think. Well, scholarship is always important. I mean, it's always an important part. I mean, I mean, reports are a little bit different, or care plans are a little bit different, but when you have a scholarly paper, and that's, I, is there any best practice on that or not really? Because the purpose is to write, you know, a really good scholarly paper following all the guidelines. But if the grammar and writing is not good, the organization is good, it really detracts from understanding it. So that's where I get confused. But then aren't we saying in that kind of a paper, we are saying that the purpose of that yes. is, yeah. in fact, yeah. Scholarly Yes, that's the purpose. Yeah, well, I think you bump grammar way up on it. Yeah. 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 Whereas, okay. whereas a reflection kind yeah. of thing. No, the, no that's the purpose exactly. of that. Is yes. for your own yeah. Let me interrupt. Well, you know, it is five o'clock if anyone needs to go. Please, yeah. Yeah. Stay, please do that. But I think yeah. when you have multiple drafts, maybe you have an early draft that's really focused. My first draft for my students in French is always entirely content. There's no grammar whatsoever. Okay. Then the second draft is content and spelling. And, and so you can have a draft that's just focused on spelling, and then spelling is a whole grade. 
So if you do multiple drafts, as the big research paper has multiple components. You do the method section and do all these different graphs. So during each component, you can change your reading rubric and they have to know ahead of time what's being graded. I think sharing with your students what your objective is and what your grade rubric is before they write the paper, and some of them don't know what to do with that information. You give them the rubric and the objective, and they go, okay, well, I'm going to put that in my folder. Um, talking class, this is why I'm asking you to write this. This is the objective. This is why I want you This is how you match what we've been talking in class and what your book says with that objective. I think being very explicit about what we're doing in teaching, what a pedagogical rationale behind it is, right. can really help the student think break things down and target what they're doing. So this paper is not about grammar and spelling. Okay. That's what she said. Is she really going to hold up to that? Yes, that's what the rubric says. Okay. Then the second time, all grammar and spelling. All right. And so sharing with the students, why yeah. you doing something? I could see, even see do, doing that if the assignments are not multiple drafts. The first assignment, you're going to give feedback. That's how they write. And then up the percentage for the next one. Yeah. You could do that, too. Yeah. And I, I sometimes... Um, I mean, I handle this differently, but sometimes, regardless of what percentage I've said, uh, different things will count. I'll, I'll sometimes say when I, re when I return a paper, um, you've already gotten draft feedback. I'm not opening up the possibility of revising this altogether. Mm -hmm. But if you, uh, if you choose to just work on editing your paper more carefully um, for a pop, you know, possible improvement in your grade, you may choose to do this, and in fact, I would encourage some of you to do it. You can't, you don't have the possibility of an A now, but you right. can, in a way, earn. It. So I try to build in enough incentive, even after the fact, for a person. And you can get to everybody. Everybody? Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is back to Alex's point about yeah. what, you know, is it fair to the person? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, there's one other thing I was going to say about that, though. Um, oh, I guess just this is obvious, but kind of to remind all of us, no matter how, what we say, about how important uh, punctuation and spelling and all that sort of thing is for um, scholarly stuff. Things get published all the time in top flight journals yeah. that have been uh, reviewed and edited by many, many, many eyes that still have errors in them. So even then, I think we need to be careful about, you know, standards are important, but, but I just think we need to be careful about not having some things count. Well, I have another question much. with that. Would you be okay with your student hiring an editor? Or is that cheating? Is it okay for the student? The grad students can. Whether it's a writing center or whether it's just a buddy, or can they get the paper revised with someone else? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would argue yeah. one of our jobs as teachers is to help students get a realistic assessment of their abilities, yeah. to the help them grow as much as we can, yeah. and then to help them see what should your strategies be like. Yes. I've said to my son, Evan, you know that someone has got to see your work before you send it to anybody else, um, even at even at work. So I said, so there's stuff you're really good at. You can trade off what you're doing, and and I think we often need to be better at being honest with ourselves, so we can be honest with our students about how much it matters and when the Star Trek Into Darkness, right? The whole movie campaign for the latest Star Trek didn't have a colon in it. So the title of the movie is Star Trek Into Darkness, right? Not Star Trek into darkness, right? And how many layers did that go through? And they read things that aren't edited. We send them emails. The first email I ever sent out to see faculty had some like glaring spelling error in the subject line. Um, and they're really good at managing their time and efficiency. So if we can help them focus, too, this is when it's important.